This is Reasons to be Cheerful with Ed Miliband and Jeff Lloyd. Hello. Hello. I first must say, I just want to make this point. Don't take this the wrong way. I feel like I'm in an interrogation in some kind of. I've got this. I've got this ridiculous dog uh, with its light bulb and no light shade, and it's like it's like it's like shining. Yeah, okay. On me. This lamp was a wedding present. Should we should we, should we put the dog somewhere yeah. else? Unfortunately, they... I don't mind the dog being lit, but it's just it's all sort of. This is the tr- this is trouble with the lighting in this loft. The lampshade. I'm not complaining about your lighting. Your hospitality is brilliant. I nearly burned the house down that's, with this lampshade. That's which the kind is of thing I, I would do. Actually, off. that was the thing I would um, do. But unfortunately, okay, you can switch it back on now. Oh. Too much, isn't it? It is too much. But yeah. if I turn it off, we're sitting in the dark. I know, I know. I and mean, it's more flattering the lighting. That's true. Thanks a lot. Don't, don't know what. To, don't know what to do with it. Um, hey, what are we going to be talking about this week then? Hey, <laughs> hey now. <laughs> Can you tell that I was a radio DJ in did a former when life you were, when you were doing the DJ stuff on Absolute? Did you have a kind of, um, you know, sign off, sign out, sign on? You know, that's the way it is, Walter Cronkite. You know. No, I ne- never really uh, had a catchphrase. You may know. Yeah, catchphrase. That's what I was yeah. groping for. <laughs> I mean, I, uh, I mean, catchphrases could have included stuff like, hang on a minute, am I on? Or, yeah. oh, oh, hang on a minute, I've not lined the next song up. Here, you know, here's I think what those you, were inadvertent. Here's what, you, here's what you could have won. Yeah, those are sort of inadvertent catchphrases. What are points, mate? Yeah. But, but hey, Ed. Hey. What's coming up on the show today? What's coming up on the show today is we are going to be talking to somebody who used to work for me, Torsten Bell, now director of the Resolution Foundation, uh, and also Heather Boucher, who runs the Centre for Equitable Growth in Washington, about a really important issue, even more important at the time at Christmas, uh, which is overtime and people doing overtime and not getting paid extra. And Britain is um is massively unusual across the developed world in having basically no proper rules on getting extra pay for overtime uh, which they have in most other european countries they have in the united states they have even in china uh, and they don't have here and you know that there's this cost of living crisis which you know lots of people are experiencing and this is a part of it and we'll be talking about solutions to that issue and i think it is a really put it's a billion hours of paid overtime done every year in britain and those billion hours are for the most part not properly compensated that's so weird that britain is so different i mean sometimes you can feel that we're a bit behind on that kind of stuff compared to people on mainland europe but compared to america even either, the united states wow even the united states and i think it's a you know it's a it's it's a specific thing that could be done to make a difference to people and coming in to pitch ideas which could be potential reasons to be cheerful, we're joined by a very funny comedian called Jess Foster Q, who um, I should get to tell us about the show that she's doing at the moment because she's got an extraordinary story, a real thing that happened to her that she subsequently turned into an Edinburgh show and that she's touring. She's, she's really funny. But should we start with reasons to be cheerful? Do you want to go first? Okay. Um, I... Um, because we're so close to Christmas, I have a little tradition that I've done, I guess, since I was 20, where every year I go to the pictures to see It's a Wonderful Life. And my wife and I have found a cinema that are showing it. And and yet again, I will be going there to watch the story of So that's year number 23. I'm not rubbing it in. I'm not rubbing it in. Remind me about It's a Wonderful Life. So It's a Wonderful Life is... Jimmy Stewart is a a good guy who grows up in a small town. Due to a chain of events, he ends up taking over his family business, which is arranging small loans and building houses uh, for the poorer people in the community. And there's there's a mean old capitalist there who wants to take over his company and um, and get all the the working class, the thrifty working class working for him in that town. And it's like one man's struggle against that, I guess, setting against the backdrop of Christmas time and it's like this wonderful family film and I, I, I'm i usually crying within seconds. Like It's become a trigger for me because I know by the end of the film I'll be in floods of tears. Do you cry a lot at the cinema? Oh, yeah, yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah. I'm rarely not crying. I've cried at... I cried when Lance and Martin left home and away. Um, when was that? Like when I was at school, still. I mean, I I, I struggled. Jason and Kylie I, let, I cried at that. Cried when uh, they showed a montage of Gabby Roslin's best bits before she left the Big Breakfast. Any reality show where they're showing a montage of people's best bits, <laughs> they're in floods of tears. Just um, yeah, I, I'm very very easily moved to tears. Really, you, you strike me as a man who's uh, mm, lacrimose. Uh, mm. 
not not particularly my wife more than me actually in relation to television or film. Because I know you cried at the film Pride. I did. How did you know? It's the first time we ever met. I asked you when was the last oh, right. time you yeah, cried. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you didn't tell me the real That's answer, the kind which of, was that, you know, when a member of your shadow cabinet said something bad about you. That you that, that that is briefed um, against you. That is a uh, that's a nightmare question for politicians, though. Why? Well, because that's the kind of thing you know. In a way, it's interesting, isn't it? That's the kind of question you get quote unquote caught out on. You say something, you get the piss ripped out of you. You know what I mean? Yeah, but it's good to good to let it out. I mean, it's to be honest, I cry too much. I'm often in the when Ed Ball fetal... said he cried at um, was it Antiques Roadshow? It became this sort of whole thing. Now maybe it was good, but it was like you know, it's kind of a whole thing. Um, you know, it's the kind of thing that gets blown up out of all proportion. Right. Well, I think it's a testament to how little impact my interview with you had that you didn't get blown up out of all yeah. proportion no, to do, try and get the film Pride. No, indeed. And then I lost the election. Uh, <laughs> I don't think you can blame me for that. I think it would be very unfair to blame you. So yeah. that is a lovely tradition. Yeah. So every year I'll go and see that and, um, you know, have many, many thoughts. Many Because I've seen it so many times, I have any number of witticisms that I can whisper into my wife's ear during it, which, you know, tends to just be met with eye rolling. But Does yeah. she cry? Yeah, yeah, she's a big crier as well. Oh, yeah, really? uh, she comes from a long line of criers. You know, some people ha- grow up with these very. Does it upset you when she cries? No, I don't mean that. A wonderful life. No, I mean I do mean. I mean I don't mean when she cries about some uh, sort of domestic thing that happened. But does it upset you when she cries at a film if you're not crying? Yeah, because I think I've gone dead on the inside. But to be yeah. honest, it's very rare that I'm not crying first. Right, well, that's good. Big cryer. Get your lac- in... lacrimosal yeah. glands. I'm having sort of touch going with those first. emotions. Yeah. Um, how about yourself? What's your reason to be cheerful? It's not week? nearly as sort of... Festive? Uh, festive, uh, thank you, uh, as that. Um, it is that Rupert Murdoch, on the day we speak, has essentially given up on his bid to uh, take over Sky News. And I am cheerful about that because m- me, Ken Clark, Vince Cable, Charlie Faulkner, Lord Faulkner, we've been doing this campaign. Avaz, the campaign group, lots of people who, who are part of them, have been doing this campaign over the last... Um, yeah, since the bid was launched almost exactly a year ago to try and stop this happening because we just thought we don't want Rupert Murdoch getting more power, even more power over our media. He owns the Sun and the Times and various radio interests and all of that. Um, we, we don't want him having more power. And, you know, when I first launched and they tried it in 2011, then they got derailed by phone hacking, tried to take it over. And when I first launched the opposition to this, you know, even people who are my mates were saying, "Well, it's a kind of lost cause, mate. You know, it's not going to happen. I mean, it's going to happen. You, you're not your your attempt to stop it is not going to happen." Um, and then, sort of inch by inch, we got more scrutiny of it. We got get, the government give credit to Karen Bradley, the Culture Secretary. She referred the bid to the Competition and Markets Authority to look at the issue of the power of Murdoch and whether he would uphold broadcasting standards and. You know, I don't think it's the only reason why he's essentially sold out to Disney, but clearly they were very frustrated by how slow it was, this bid to go through. And so I think it is quite an important win. You've stuck it to the media mogul. Yeah, I think it's... You've made him throw in the towel. I think it's important. Uh, and I think, um, you know, in a way, I think it's... Look, it's not the biggest thing on anyone's agenda. I noticed somebody from uh, National Public Radio tweeted saying, you know, in any other year, at any other moment, this will be like an absolutely massive story about the climb down. And because there's so much else around, for reasons I understand, it isn't the, a massive story, but I think it, it, it's important what, what happened. You met Rupert Murdoch on one occasion? Uh, I think I met him twice. I think I did a Times Business Summit, but I literally had a sort of, you know, handshake in the green room. Is it like the icy grip of death when you shake hands with him? He was sort of mostly dis- seemed disinterested in me. I mean, he, was, he wasn't going to be naturally sympathetic to me. Um, and I did go to famously to his drinks party, which I wish I hadn't gone to. Um, and then hacking happened and all that. I mean, he's quite beguiling in the way he presents himself. But you know, if you look at what Fox News is doing and the and the absolute, you know, this is a daily thing going on on Fox News. The you know, the latest being undermining Robert Mueller, the special. Council looking at the connections to Russia. You know, they are an absolutely ruthless media machine, you know, propagating a false narrative about for everything from President Obama being born abroad to, you know, goodness knows what else, and Russia, Trump, etc. And we didn't want Sky News to become like Fox News. 
Well, congratulations, you've done it. Was it well? Pro- let's. No, no, know, come on. Credit where credit's well, due. Ed. Well, no. The only thing I say is I don't believe it until I see it. You know, the Disney deal's got to go through, and we've got to make sure that Disney is going to be a proper owner of Sky, and that is important. And, and you know, we've got to we've got to see the absolute sort of you know signed, sealed, and delivered before we believe it. And you're not worried about Mickey Mouse having an undue influence on British politics? I think I'd rather have Mickey Mouse and Rupert Murdoch, frankly. <laughs> Reasons to be cheerful, a podcast about ideas with Ed Miliband and Jeff Lloyd. Now, to talk about the issue of overtime pay, I'm really pleased that joining us is Torsten Bell, the director of the Resolution Foundation. I should say at the outset that Torsten was the head of policy for me while I was leader of the Labour Party, Torstykins, as I used to call him. Did, uh, to his face? Yeah, I did, actually. Uh, you didn't hear what I was calling him uh, uh, <laughs> at, the, um, at that point. The, the thing about Torsten is, just to set the context, is that uh, I was with um, I was doing an event for him on this issue of overtime pay uh, earlier this week, and, and I was talking to David Willits, who has got a role at the Resolution Foundation, former Conservative MP, and he said, we should compare notes on what it's like to work with Torsten. And I said, no, no, David, we should compare notes on what it's like to work for Torsten. Uh, and <laughs> He basically these, these stories are going to end in tears. Uh, in, uh, indeed. Uh, let's move on to the substance. Uh, indeed. Um, so, so was it easy t- to find work after working for Ed? Did you have to sort of scrub that bit out of your CV and pretend really that you've been travelling for it three years? It was really tricky, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean... Gap know, four and a half life, years. Life's always full of... Um, denials and selective memories, and I think that's an important part of most people's <laughs> experiences. Right, yeah. Um, and how is it at the Resolution Foundation? Well, the Resolution Foundation is very good, although uh, the background to that is obviously that a lot of what we work on, which is um, how to what's happening to and how to improve the living standards of people on low and middle incomes, is less than yeah. uh, good. Britain's been a pretty tough time. For Do you work harder than you work for me or less hard? Uh, I work um, less Smarter. hours. But well, it's pretty smart then. But the uh, <laughs> no, we work less hours. But the um, but that is has uh, not unrelated to having two small children as well. Yeah. And who who knew it? Life is full of trade offs. But you didn't really get much sleep when you worked for me, did you? I, I wasn't exactly the ideal employer. Uh, I think the problem is British politics rather than your yeah. specific style. Oh, politics nice in, politics in general requires fairly full on. Yeah, it really yeah. does. The two AM emails that I received from Ed are they? Is that a, a recent development, or has he always uh, been? No, up? you haven't set up the auto delete function. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I can I can show you on your phone. It's very swift. It's fine. Or you just do a response, which is which is just stop it. <laughs> stop it stop it now move on we're trying to change the country and your email habits remember i did work good? for gordon brown for a long period <laughs> <laughs> i learned everything i knew from him um tell us a bit because you, you you talked about it a little bit already but but talk to us about what the resolution foundation is looking at and then let's talk about the issue of, of overtime pay overall our focus is um uh, something that was ignored too often in British political and policy making debates before the financial crisis, which is what exactly is happening to the living standards of uh, working people, particularly those on low and middle incomes. The, um, and that is because although people used to write scripts, and I was working in the Treasury before the financial crisis, we'd write scripts saying everything's going really well because GDP is growing. He said to delete that from his CV as well, by the way. <laughs> sort of, his CV is quite blank. Uh. Well, was, the, the best events are ones where you get introduced as someone that was in the Treasury during the banking crisis and then lost two general. Elections. Yeah, <laughs> and then you're like, oh, "Thank you for the invite. We are back." <laughs> no, but more seriously, you you look at the GDP figures and you'd be like, "Well, those look pretty good. They're growing at two and a half percent. That's the historical norm." And then you'd kind of, if you were a bit of a lefty, you might be like, "Well, wait a second. Let's have a look at the GDP per capita stats because we care what people get per head." In other words, yeah. per head. So we look at those and we'd be like, "Well, it's not quite as good, but you know, one and three quarters, one and a half percent, still growing. It's pretty good." Um, but no one was a commie enough uh, to dig into it um, and say, "What's actually happening to?" Uh, incomes that actual people are getting and if you looked at that then you'd get to like oh god well it's coming in around like one percent and then if you were a complete marxist you might have been like okay let's take the pensioners out let's just look at what's happening to working people's incomes and then you get to like dangerously close to zero and that was going on in the middle of the uh, 2000s um, and we didn't realize that was happening until 2009 so the resolution foundation exists to make sure those kind of mistakes never happen again to make sure that we are both on the pulse of what the data says is happening to uh, the living standards of those and low middle incomes and we do focus groups and lots of qualitative work to make sure what people say is happening in their lives is reflected in the british public policy debate and then we can advocate for policies to make that better and was that the low point of it or has it got better since then no, no, no. In lots of ways, that was the high point. 
Wow. No, it's got a lot better. It's got a lot worse than since then. And also, you'll remember that we have, in those days, we were doing a thing called increasing benefit spending, which went to low-income working families. And we are now in the business of the thing called cutting it. And that's why over the next few years, actually, if anything, you'd expect the incomes of lower-income working families to be harder hit than they were actually in the immediate aftermath of the financial crisis. And that is a really serious problem. And you've got this quite shocking statistic that you produced after the last budget, which which I always get wrong, which is that earnings won't get back to 2008 levels, average earnings or median earnings until 2025. Is that right? Yeah, average earnings look like they're on track to only get back to their pre-crisis peak in the middle of the next decade. And that is what a disaster in living standards looks like. And we have never seen anything like that in any living memory. We haven't really probably seen anything like it for a few centuries. Uh, this is what a catastrophe is. So what are we going to do about it? One of the things we might do about it is look at the issue of not just the minimum wage, the living wage, which is, you know, about low paid people, um, but but also at the issue of overtime, which is about low paid people. But it's not just about low paid people. So tell us about this issue of overtime and wh- where does the UK stand on this issue? How does that compare to other countries? Well, the first thing to say is overtime is a massive deal and nobody in Westminster or in politics ever talks about it. And the basic reason for that um, was two reasons. But one of the basic reasons is almost nobody in Westminster does paid overtime because you're much more likely to get paid overtime if you get paid by the hour. As soon as you're salaried, unless you're uh, some lower earning salary, people might get paid overtime, but lots uh, don't. So because politicians have never met any of it, they don't talk about it very much. And then secondly, since the 1990s in Britain, we have been an international outlier in doing almost nothing to regulate overtime. It's basically do what you want. If your employer happens to offer you extra pay for doing overtime, great. Um, but they may may just pay you what they pay you for every other hour you work. And that's become increasingly normal. And this is not a small deal. The um, uh, 2.6 million people a year do overtime. They're they're doing over a billion hours of it a year. So this is a lot of hours work and it matters what people get paid for that work. Before we get to what we might do here, what do other countries do on overtime? Well, there's three broad uh, things you want to have a think about. There's, there's, as we've just discussed, limits to the hours you can do. So some countries literally just say you can't do any. I think in Luxembourg, you have to actually have permission from the firm must have got permission from the state to be able to offer you overtime. Wow. The, and I think in Poland, it's very restrictive um, as well. So some countries have incredibly restrictive practices where they just basically don't want it to happen. Uh, full stop. Some countries... So that's like limits on it. Then there's a second set of things which I would loosely call kind of protections, which are, for example, in New Zealand, they've recently passed rules to say um, that you ca- it cannot be to your detriment if you refuse overtime. So you can't be like punished for turning it down, Yeah, which is a pretty sensible thing to do. And then there's New York. And in New York, which, you know, is in America, some people think it's like the heart of the evil beast of capitalism. They're looking at, um, they're making progress on implementing uh, minimum times at which you have to know your shifts in advance. So you have, you can't have surprise scheduling. So you get told at least two weeks in advance when you're going to be working. And if things change nearer than that, they have to pay you extra uh, for the price. So there's lots of protections around those two things. So you've got time limits, you've got protections. And then the last thing is pay, which is obviously a main focus of our report this week. Um, and on pay, you get lots of things across the world. In Austria, for example, there's very tough rules around you just have to be paid extra. In Australia, they have a slightly different system where uh, anybody who's on a non-standard contract, which basically keeps them more insecure, just gets paid a 25% uplift, basically. Everybody. The, um, and this isn't just about minimum wage lots, workers. And in some countries, you get time and a half, don't you? So in some 50%. countries, you get uh, time and a half. Lots of the time and a half is the traditional UK position in lots of sectors in the area when we had something that no one will ever remember called wages councils, which were largely abolished in the 19, by, the, by the 1990s. We had one left after that. But the, um, uh, so, and the, lots of those had sectoral agreements of around time and a half. So some people's parents and others will remember with nostalgia at the time when that was the norm. Some of that is left in manufacturing in the UK where there's still trade unions and there tends to be, I'm honest, older male workforces. Um, but there's not that. There's only about one in five um, people now get a time and a half for their overtime. So the things people should be talking about are uh, limits on how many hours of overtime you can do so you don't get somebody overworked, protection so they don't get stuffed over with short-term changes, and then making sure they get paid properly for overtime hours they do. And even the US as a country as a whole pays people by law, federal law, you get paid extra if you work more than a certain number of hours. If you're over 40 hours a week and you're a low earner, you'll get paid overtime. So Britain is very much an outlier in the lack of protections we have around overtime. For, among yeah, European we're an outlier for, for rules about it and we're an outlier because we never talk about it. So what should we do? 
Well, I mean, I think there's some things that is really easy. Um, we should definitely be following the example of New Zealand and looking at the example of New York on some of these protections I talk about. So around ensuring that nobody loses out if they turn down overtime, you should never have to accept it. Um, and in terms of having moving to a normal people getting advance notice of their shifts. And some companies have already started doing that. IKEA has recently moved to full, more forward uh, guidance for their staff at when their shifts will be. Uh, and there's no reason uh, for companies, you know, we spend our time on our apps and all this complicated stuff. Everyone tells AI is changing the world. Well, then why on earth can't people run their rotors a few weeks in advance? It's not rocket science. So we should just be doing that kind of stuff at the basics. And this is to counter the, you know, people don't know from one day to the next you know, how many hours are expected to do, how much they're going to be paid, you know, whether they can make ends meet. Yeah, so at the extreme end of this, you've got people, and you know, you'll have been on trains with people sometimes, you see them looking at their phones. I remember a guy, I was on a train coming into North London, and a guy was on his phone, uh, and he was texting that he wasn't needed for work that day. The guy was on the shift into town, you know, and this guy did not have a lot of money. It was not a well-paid job, and that's him stuff for the day. Yeah. Like there is no, there is no excuse for that being the way our labour market works, and there's no excuse for the offer that Britain has to him about being able to make his way in the world involves anything like that happening. So that kind of stuff just needs stopping. And is that part of the same thing as zero-hour contracts? So he will almost certainly have been on a zero-hour contract, although you could imagine that he might have been on a kind of six-hour contract. He'd done his six hours the day before, and this was like extra work. So it could have been around it, but. In, in essence, yes, he's on some form of zero hours contract where he feels totally at the whim. The flexibility is all on the side of the employer, not of the employee. Now, that's clearly not in the case in all use of zero hours contracts. Some people have zero hours contracts, but they're told well in advance when their shifts are and they genuinely want the flexibility and they feel they can say no. And that is the key. They can say no. The, um, but that is not the case if you need that money for the basics to live. And and pay premia. You're interested in the issue of pay premia, how we have premiums for people who do overtime. Yeah. So as I say, so lots of people now do uh, paid overtime, but they just paid their standard rate rather than any extra to reward them for taking that insecurity for the hours of work. And we think there's a case for, uh, in the first instance, piloting a number of different ways of having a minimum level of overtime pay premium. So you get at least 10%, 20%, 50% of your normal pay if you do hours on the weekend or things that aren't part of your standard shifts, particularly if they happen at short notice. um, Now, the reason that needs to be piloted is in the UK, we have no experience. We have very little evidence of what will happen when it does this. Since wages councils were abolished. Since wages councils. um, And it is important to get this right because... Uh, if you do something like this, you make it more expensive for employers to offer overtime, you're going to have winners and losers. You're going to have winners, some of whom are going to get offered more um, fixed hours in their contracts. So they'll get increased security. That's good for them. You'll get some winners who won't get more security, but will get paid more for the insecure hours they do. If they want them to do overtime, they have to pay extra and just, for that Just privilege. before we get to the downside, it's really important to explain this to people, isn't it? You know, lots of people talk about zero hours contracts. And, you know, personally, I think we should sort of essentially get rid of them. If you do regular hours, you should get a regular contract. But there are also short hours contracts where you might be only have a standard contract of four or eight hours. And then you're expected to just sort of adjust, fill in, take all the risk on yourself. What this would encourage employers to do is to say, look, if you're going to have somebody on a short term contract and you ask them to do more hours, you're going to have to pay them a premium for that. So maybe you should extend the the standard contract to them. Is that, is that basically the yeah, logic? Yeah, so this is a rebalancing of if there's going to be flexibility, who's going to pay for that flexibility and who's going to benefit from it? And that's an important thing because more generally in our society, we have moved to a situation where too much risk lies with individuals rather than with firms and with the state. And obviously as individuals, we're all less well set up to manage that risk than we are as a collective. And you were saying that you've got, you, you're looking at sort of piloting the way it gets done because you want to avoid... Well, because as I was saying, so there's winners, extra hours uh, that are certain and fixed in your contract, or you get paid more for it. But there will be losers because some people will just simply get less hours. Some firms will just decide if it costs more to pay overtime pay, then I just won't offer it at all. And so that is, that's a real thing, and we shouldn't be we shouldn't be flippant about that because you know it, it matters that we are it matters that people are able to get the incomes. Maximize would it their encourage incomes. people to employ more workers? Maybe so. In other words, you wouldn't offer the overtime; you just employ possibly, more people. So possibly you could employ more people on, on actual fixed hours contracts. That may be a good thing as well. But some people may end up with less hours overall, and that is why you need to park this to see whether that effect is large. Or not, but the main thing is, I don't, I don't think there's a case for not trying this. It doesn't done in lots of other countries. We've done it here in the past in the UK, and at the moment we have a very, well, not a very, we have a tight labour market. I.e., we have particularly high employment. We have almost the highest employment on record in the UK. That is the right time to start strengthening employment protections, trying out new things because the risk is just much lower. And do you think that this minimum wage for overtime 
time and a half for overtime at the maximum. Do you think it can make a difference to the living standards crisis that you talked about at the beginning? Overtime is a big deal for those people that do it, but it is also for a, less, you know, a minority of people do overtime. So we are in the big picture. How we solve the big picture living standards crisis this country faces has got to involve a lot of other things. But you know, you, you've always in life got to make progress where you can make progress. The government is actually having to respond soon to a thing called the Matthew Taylor Review of Modern Employment Practices. He and that recommended moving towards a higher minimum wage for overtime hours. Uh, that's a good thing. And the reason we've done this report is because the government should be looking at his proposals, but actually wider, more bolder proposals for looking at paid overtime. That's why this is a thing to look at now. L- last question from me. You wrote a piece uh, around the anniversary of the financial crisis, I think a few months ago, um, sort of saying that we'd missed the opportunity since the financial crisis to sort of think big about, you know, not just the lessons of that regulation and all that, but but how we wanted to reorient our society and our economy. Is, is this part of it? This should definitely be part of it. Looking again at the what the real lived experience is of the world of work in Britain today and how we can make that better, how we can make it better paid, but also more secure and more dignified should be one of the, you know, the big changes that we bring to our economy, having been through this horrendous experience. Torsten, it's very inspiring seeing how you've rebuilt your life after working for Ed. So thank you. Therapy therapy is an amazing thing. I recommend it to anyone. So we're joined now from Washington by Heather Boucher, who is the executive director of the Centre for Equitable Growth, uh, which campaigns and, and works on some of the issues that we were just talking about with Torsten Bell. Heather, it's great to have you with us. Oh, it's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Just tell us, first of all, about this issue of overtime pay in the United States and, you know, guaranteed higher minima for overtime. We don't have anything like what you've got in the U.S., but tell us a bit about the U.S. experience, including the recent U.S. experience on this. Yeah, certainly. So overtime pay has been an issue that's been on the policy agenda for over a century and a half um, here in the U.S., It's the idea that people should be paid more than their usual wage if they work more than um, the standard number of hours. And um, it was codified into law for the nation as a whole as a part of the 1938 Fair Labor Standards Act, which is um, still to this day the most important piece of legislation around um, uh, wages and hours in the United States. It's sort of the foundation for our labor standards um, rules. And what it did was it said is that for workers who are production workers, non-supervisory, who put in um, more than 40 hours a week, any hours over that 40 have to be paid time and a half, so 150% right. of your usual pay. And um, uh, the the threshold and the, the, the rules themselves are actually quite complicated. Um, I will note that there's no other rules on overtime. So if you're a salaried employee, there's no rules on how many hours your employer can make you work. Um, and um, the employer can make you work as many hours as they want over 40, but they just have to pay you this additional um, payment if you are covered by the law. So it's not a cap. It's just an overtime uh, pay, which is, of course, to induce employers to work people less. Um the rules for the overtime um, legislation are very complex, and there's a lot of sort of uh, nitty-gritty details, but one of them is that there is an earnings threshold, um, so that if you earn above that threshold, you do not have to be paid time and a half, even if you put in more than 40 hours a week. And um, the threshold here in the United States has not, um, had not been updated since the 1970s. What is it at at the moment? Well, so it's at a little over um, uh, $20,000 a year, um, but it had been updated in 2016 by the um, uh, Obama administration, had sought to um, increase the threshold so it kept up with inflation and moved it up to about 47000 a little over $47,000 a year, but that was held up in the courts and it hasn't been implemented yet, and the Trump administration... Um, stopped 
pushing back in the courts to implement it, but they um, sort of have conceded it looks like that they want to uh, move it from about 23000 to about $31,000 a year, um, right. which is far below where it would have been if it just kept, kept pace with inflation since the 1970s. Where would it have been if it had kept pace with inflation since the 1970s? It would have been about almost a, a little over $47,000 a year, so right. more than double its current level. You know, and the interesting thing is that a lot of employers, once they heard about the new regulations from the Obama administration, a lot of employers had already started to implement the new threshold, which actually we did at our organization. Other organizations I've worked at over the past couple of years also did that. Um, so about half of employers now have already put in place these high, higher thresholds, not necessarily as high as that, which shows that it can be done, but it's just being stalled by the current administration. And and how important is this, do you think, as a tool to, you know, address the issue of stagnant, stagnating wages and earnings, which is a big problem in the United States and a big problem in Britain as well? Well, overtime can be incredibly important for those families that, that get it. Um, it can make the difference from being a low-income family to putting a family solidly into the middle class. Um uh, my fa- my father was a manufacturing worker, and I definitely know that overtime was what made the difference for my family growing up. Um, but you can certainly see that in the data as well, that it really can make the difference for families in terms of their incomes. On the other hand, um, it can also help ensure that people aren't overworked, which is just as important in many parts of the economy, that um, people aren't putting in these excruciating long hours that were in place, you know, a century ago uh, before we implemented this nationwide, where manufacturing workers were putting in 60, 70, 80 hours a week. So that's important. But because it doesn't cover everyone, it means that there is still an extensive amount of overwork for salaried workers who are not covered by this legislation. So um, I, it's, it's an important step, but um, for it to really, truly be valuable, it would need to, to, to do more to cover more workers um, overall. By raising the income threshold, basically. Yeah, by raising the income threshold um, or by uh, uh, changing the rules so that, so that it applied to, to salaried workers more generally. And I'm not saying that you want to totally um, uh, put uh, thresholds on hours, but, you know, at the United States, um, even among, especially among professional workers, they put in very long hours relative to workers in other countries. And that limits the number of jobs available in the economy. You've got too many people who are doing a job and a half, essentially. And also, presumably, that's a phenomenon of unpaid overtime. In other words, not paid you know, the amount you get for other hours, but just no pay at all for overtime, I guess. Exactly. And so you're just doing it so that you can either keep your job or so that you can impress your boss. But, um, you know, not having any of these these long hours cutoffs is really is really a problem. And this overtime issue is also connected somewhat to another issue, which I think characterizes many people, the problems many people face in the UK and in the US, which is sort of insecure scheduling, not knowing from one day to the next or one week to the next whether you've got work, how many hours uh, of work you've got. Are there solutions to address that in the US? Certainly. So, um, I mean, it's interesting. We don't uh, we don't have the concept of zero um, hours contracts because people don't have contracts in the same way. However, you have a lot of workers in the United States that are subject to unpredictable schedules um, where, you know, they'll find out on Thursday what their schedule is going to be for the next work week. Or um, they'll show up for work and they'll find out, oh, gosh, you know, your shift was canceled. Sorry, go home. And especially in places um, where workers are taking public transport or it's taking them a long time to get to work because of traffic um, and they've already paid the babysitter and they've already turned down their yeah. other job or whatever. These are real big problems. Um, so in a number of places, um, uh, New York, um, San Francisco, Seattle, and, you know, increasingly people are talking about this nationwide – there are these um, new rules being put in place that say, okay, you need to give your worker some stable, um, some scheduling stability. So we're going to penalize employers that change schedules within a week um, on their workers. Uh, or um, there's also um, in these places some rules in place that say if the person shows up for work but their shift is canceled, they still get paid some part of that wage. So they get paid for two or four hours or something so that they um, all of that isn't just lost to them. And, you know, there's a lot of research and evidence that shows that this 
um, that both that these policies can go a long way and they're not only good for workers and their families, but they're also cost effective. Um, Equitable Growth funded a study by a couple of scholars um, who did a pilot inside uh, a, a big retail in the United States called The Gap. And um, they went in and piloted what ha- would happen if they moved to stable schedules. And they found out that actually it improved um, employee retention and, of course, employee happiness. But it also um, was good for productivity and um, good for so good for the bottom line. And in fact, um, the Gap was so happy with the pilot that they changed their scheduling rules in all of their stores midway through the study, messing up our research project. But um, wow. But, you know, really demonstrating you overachieved, you overachieved totally. But um, but really showing that this is this this can be good for business um, as well. So so that is something that people are thinking about. And and my understanding is that that's relevant to um, to what's what's happening in your country, too. Definitely it is. We're talking about a whole set of policies here, which um, are about how you improve living standards, uh, for people. Are there other areas of policy that we should be learning from in the US or that you see here and you think you'd like to see them in the US? Well, of course, the big one here in the US is that we do not give people the right to paid leave when they for to care for a new child, for their own illness or to care for a family member. And of course, you right. all have um, maternity leave, but we are really working on extending that kind of paid leave to workers for all caring needs. Um, and we've seen a number of states make um, big, bold changes in this direction in recent years, New, uh, California, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and now Washington, D.C. and Washington State, both are going to be put in place laws. So we, we've been learning from you all, but trying to extend it and really making it gender neutral and um, including all forms of care. Um, the, uh, the other place, of course, where we are woefully behind is um, just in sick leave more generally. Of course, you know, millions of workers in the United States don't have the right to stay home if they're sick and not lose a day pay, day's pay or fear of losing their job. So these are big ones. But, you know, it's interesting when I learned that you all didn't have overtime pay in the same way that we do. I do think that this is something um, that is that is really important and certainly helps workers and um improves uh, living standards. So I applaud the fact that you are talking about that one. And this is all part of a way of thinking about the economy, which you have been one of the leading pioneers of, and and it's called sort of middle out economics as opposed to trickle down economics. Just say a little bit about what the concept is, because you mentioned there that it's good for business. This is not just about redistribution, is it? It's about a lot more than that. Yeah. I mean, for a long time, I think we've talked about inequality and um, supporting the middle classes, things that were just good for workers and families, which, of course, they are. But what we really lost sight of was this idea that if you make it easier for people to get to work and um, have a good paying job, that there are broader macroeconomic implications of this. Um, and that making sure that uh, you have stable uh, consumer demand is, you know, critical for having a stable economy. People not relying on debt to make up for lost incomes, for example, is one way that, that middle out really is important. Um, and on the other hand, really making sure, um, you know, especially in the United States where we're falling behind um, uh, other developed countries in terms of labor force participation and child health outcomes, making sure that you're giving families time to care and that you're making sure that they can adjudicate between work and family so that they can be those highly productive workers and so that they can really participate in the labor market. That actually, and while making sure they have healthy kids, that all goes a long way in improving long-term productivity and, um, uh, and, and economic growth. So here at Equitable Growth, we do a lot to, to, show with um, solid empirical research and evidence the ways in which addressing inequality um, is good for growth or in the very least isn't bad for growth. And, and there's just so much evidence compiling now that that the way to go is really to ensure that you have a strong and vibrant middle class. That's great, Heather. I do have one final question, which is um, one of the things that I've admired in the US, and we haven't really talked about it, is the whole fight for $15 minimum wage. Uh, and the way that has spread from city to city, state to state. I mean, that presumably is delivering big gains for a lot of low-paid people in the U.S. 
Certainly. I mean, you know, the, the minimum wage was actually put in place by that same 1938 law that we talked about earlier, the Fair Labor Standards Act. And when it was first put in place, it was a dollar and it was not adjusted for inflation. And so one of the things that we've seen over the years is policymakers um, uh, adjust the minimum wage for inflation. They raise it. And um, many, many states, dozens of states at this point, all have minimum wages that are higher than the federal. And what we know from the research that is now decades old is that for the most part, when you raise these minimum wages, it's actually good for local economies. It's good for workers and their families. And it doesn't have um, uh, measurable downward effects on employment. And so the fight for 15 has really been about saying, we can do better. The minimum wage hasn't been raised um, in decade, in over a decade at this point, and um, it's fallen far behind inflation. And then you've seen so many families struggling from the fallout of the Great Recession. Um, so you've seen these campaigns, and they put the law in place, and economists are now studying it. And my guess is that we're going to find out that it's good for families and good for the economy. It's, it's, been, it's been a very exciting movement. Heather Boucher, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. It's been a pleasure. So what do you think of that then? Well, I think think you'd be an odd person to think that people being paid fairly for the work they do and not being put in the uncomfortable position of feeling they have to do work that they don't want to do through fear of losing their job or other repercussions. I think you'd be an odd person to think that was anything other than a reason to be cheerful, measures to stop that from happening, right? Well, exactly. And you know what's really interesting about this is you've got America, which people think of as a country that is like way behind us on lots of these issues, that's actually ahead of us mm. on having a proper thing for overtime, uh, on, you know, states experimenting with this secure scheduling, people having to have scheduling in advance, not the zero hours equ- contracts or the equivalent in the United States. I mean, you know, it seems to me to be a no brainer. And when I got the House of Commons Library to do some work on this uh, last middle of last year, and you you look across Europe and across the United States, and we are such an outlier on this. That's weird. It is weird. Why well, they is, used to have. Well, I think it's partly that trade unions were p- fulfilling that kind of function, and the, we had these things called wages councils, which was before the minimum wage and before the Tories government of the nineteen seventy nine to ninety seven abolished almost all of them. Wages councils sort of filling the gaps in various places. Right. And so the combination of weakness of trade unions and not having these wages councils anymore, you know, it meant, means that we just don't have a, a proper approach to these issues. And and it is all part of, you know, what what can we do about the fact that, you know, you, you just have so many people whose incomes are not rising and inflation's going up and it's just a, such a struggle for people. And I've also got a reason to be cheerful myself. I found out that premium is the plural of premium. Never knew. Nobody never never made that connection before. Well, that's you, you learn. It's something. an education. You, you're educating you, you learn me. something every day. There's but due to the my fair lady dynamic going on here, you're a, a fantastic Eliza. Uh, do you do you find that um, do do you find it sort of convincing then? Yeah, I, I, to, to the point that I. I can't imagine, especially as Torsten was saying, in a time where you've got, at least on paper, close to full employment, the, the arguments against it just seem negligible to me. Uh, and also, I think the other point that Heather made, which is really important, is this is about Britain. And this Brexit, yeah, this is about, Brexit is about this too. It's about people's sense of, you know, I'm working all the hours, I'm not making ends meet, I wanted change. That's why people in my constituency, some of them anyway, voted for Brexit. And yeah, this is, I think you can see this as being a decent thing for business too. It's not the way to run a business to have people constantly on standby and you know, no, not knowing the night before coming to work but not getting a shift. I and mean, what, what that is like Victorian era. Yeah, it's isn't awful. It? And and you know, like you said at the beginning, if all these other countries can do it, you know, fr- from America downwards, then there's no reason why we can't. It's not anti-business. This is reasons to be cheerful with Ed Miliband and Jeff Lloyd. If you've got thoughts about what you've heard on this episode or ideas for future episodes, we'd love to hear from you. You can find us on Twitter at Cheerful Podcast, or you can email reasons at cheerfulpodcast.com or on Facebook, facebook.com forward slash reasons to be cheerful. I did that quite smoothly, didn't you I? You did, yeah. I thought I'm going to leave I'm it learning. Leave it. I'm not going to interrupt. No, I'm Just learning. let you get your flow going. It's yeah, you're impressed. Good. Yeah, I've Radio 2 asked you about yet. Not yet, no. Uh, this comes from Dan, who says, Hi, Jeff and Ted. Because, of course, you, you went through a phase where you reinvented yourself as Ted. Yeah, when I was at university. It sort of happened by accident. The philosophy tutor called me Ted and it stuck. 
So is there a group of people in your life? Who know me as Ted. They don't quite know how to sort of, they've sort of now called me Ed because it's sort of, that name has sort of been erased a bit. But it's, Mm. you know. But maybe you can go back to it in later life. It's true. Like sort of David Bowie with his different incarnations. You could have a Ted incarnation that you... I'm the Bowie of politics. Is that what you're saying? Uh, no, no. Right, I fine. Get, I don't think anybody would say that. No. Ed. Um, anyway, Dan says, I've recently discovered your podcast and I've spent the last few days immersing myself in its glory. Practical idealism is how I'd describe it, if that's not an oxymoron. Less whimsical and quixotic than its contemporaries. So a big thank you and long may it continue. Oh, well, that's nice. I hope so too. I'm, I'm enjoying it. I don't think it's run its course yet. No, I think we've got a few more in us. We still like still like each other. Yeah, we think we like each other even more. I think so, yeah. yeah we do. We go on like a house on fire. It's burgeoning uh, this uh, Funny, I haven't set your house on fire, but <laughs> uh, that's uh, still to come. Uh, right, we've got Luke Henman. Um, really interesting pod hi Ed and Jeff really interesting podcast about cu- podcast about culture and regeneration Middlesbrough has some really interesting things going on in this regard our art gallery the Middlesbrough Institute of Modern Art MIMA opened in 2007 until relatively recently it was quite inaccessible and quite clinical however the current curator Alistair Hudson has transformed it his goal is to turn MIMA into the useful museum which aims to have art playing an active role in society and regeneration the museum now holds free community lunches each Thursday with asylum seekers sitting alongside people living with dementia to eat, dementia art groups, community vegetable patch, projects such as a neighbourhood working with an artist to create a Trojan horse. The communal lunch began with an exhibition on refugees, which was provocative and interactive and explored these issues with a local perspective as Middlesbrough has a high number of asylum seekers due to our cheap housing stock. They've also recently hosted an exhibition on the experience of deindustrialization in the Tees Valley in the 1980s. Again, highly political and relevant to the local community, MIMA is now much more accessible and is buzzing, whereas before it was very quiet. I think it's a textbook example of art and culture working for a local area. That sounds great. It does sound great. Yeah, we should that? go. This one comes from RM, who says, As you will have doubtless figured out from the silly Gmail account I just set up, I am taking quite seriously the idea that there should be a UK group akin to Patriotic Millionaires from episode 11, which a lot of people have said to me that uh, sounds like Karen a Karen Stewart, idea. Who, yeah. who talked about that, yeah. Um, not sure patriotic has the same overtones here, so I went for responsible, um, but would welcome better suggestions. I'm definitely not a front person for such an organisation, but would be happy to run an anonymous mailing list to get it off the ground. I don't have a lot of time, but probably more than most millionaires, and if I have to miss the odd Labour Party branch meeting to get things done, I'm sure I'll survive. Um that's that's a nice idea. He says, if Ed was serious about thinking there should be such a group in the UK, then maybe can you give out the email address on a future podcast? Regards RM, and the email address is responsible.millionaires at gmail.com. Like part of me thinking, once you've got a list of responsible millionaires, pass it on to me so I can send out some begging letters. <laughs> well, anyway, there's, a, there's an interesting idea. And on the same theme... Uh, Hello, chaps. This is John Strick. Catching up on the cheerful podcast and felt compelled to write in regarding Karen Stewart's appearance on episode 11 about taxing millionaires. What an incredible person with so much common sense. How amazing would the planet be if all millionaires thought like her? A reasonable redistribution of the wealth to the many and not the few, that sounds catchy, has to be the way forward. There is no reasonable comeback to arguments in favour of it. I know if I was in such a position, I would definitely get involved with such a project. Surely there is a mega rich folk in the UK who feel they have enough. Sadly, though, I think they'll be as hard to find as rocking horse poo. It seems, though, through experience of people I know, the more you have, the less you feel everyone should have. Greed is still a god, but just not spoken of as proudly or as ridiculously as it was in the 80s. I've got to tell you that I'm thoroughly enjoying reasons to be cheerful, and I'm entertained and educated in equal measure every week. So thank you. Kindest regards, John Strick. Thanks, John. It's a nice one. And this comes from Amelia in Oregon, who says, Hi, I listen from the US because my country's politics are too overwhelming to deal with up close and I can no longer bear listening to national public radio as regularly as I did pre-2016. Nor have I gotten particularly hooked on any other political podcasts like Pod Save America. Oh, my God. I mean, I'm sitting across from that podcast number one fan here. Oh, I am the number one fan. I'm the number one fan of, of their number of downloads, 120 million, <laughs> actually. But I also like the podcast. Or Pantsuit Nation. Have you come across that one? I haven't come no, across me, that me one. Me either. Um, she says, I do love my favourite murder because of the sociopathy of serial killers. It's less distressing to me than the sociopathy of Republican Party members. Anyway, it helps my anxiety level to be able to examine important broader issues with the benefit of distance and a wider perspective. 
I always say that the best podcasts are the ones that make you really want to have a conversation with the hosts. And you guys did that from the first episode. Jeff, can I tell you why it doesn't surprise me that Hillary Clinton would secretly favour a UBI? Me, in my head. Is Universal Basic to, Income, yeah. Of course, from episode one. And Ed is so much the antithesis of Donald Trump. It's one of my reasons to be cheerful, even when the wrong people get elected. I woke up on the 9th of November last year with something like a cross between a broken heart and a crushing hangover after crying myself to sleep. Thank you for giving me a way to reconnect to the political conversation after the trauma of 2016. All the best, Amelia in Oregon. What a nice email. It is. I'm glad that we're providing you for, with some light relief, at least, Amelia. Definitely. Send us your ideas or suggest a guest for a future episode. Email reasons at cheerfulpodcast.com. Find us on Facebook or tweet at cheerfulpodcast. And here to pitch ideas which could be potential reasons to be cheerful, we're joined by comedian Jess Foster Q. Hello. Hello. Thanks Hello. Thanks for coming round. Thanks so much for coming on. Hey, thanks for having me. I it, really like your podcast. Thank you. Aww. I really like your knitwear. You thank you. Good choice of knitwear. Yeah. M&S had a voucher. And, and you, you <laughs> sort of know Jeff's better half very well, yeah. do you? Yeah. Well, very well. I've never got off with her yet. Um, no, we're good friends. I've never got off with Jeff yet, actually, either. Yeah. Good uh, qualifying yet. We're not yeah. suggesting an orgy of any, any kind not. here. That's no, not. only of mind. Yeah, yes. yeah. An orgy of the mind. <laughs> an orgy that of the mind? Our, that should be our have, slogan for the podcast. That's good, an orgy of the mind. Yes. Cool, I have, a, I have a brain crush on um, Jeff's better half. Yeah. Yeah, yeah me too. Jess, you've brought some ideas with you have, to, to yeah. the mind orgy. Um, what is the uh, what's the first one that you Welcome have? Welcome to the mind orgy. <laughs> yeah, change the name of the podcast immediately. Yeah. I know, it's um, good, actually. So I think um, until, to make the world a better place, I think until we can 3D print our babies out, um, I have a two-year-old. You are both parents, aren't you? Mm -hmm. So um, I don't know how aware you are of this thing. So if you, when you've given birth, ha however horrific it was, um, the further away in time it gets from that event, the less well you can remember. Am amnesia, it. it's basically an evolutionary thing, isn't and it? Yes, exactly. In the same way that evolutionary, for evolutionary reason, a drug, when a man has an orgasm, there's a, a, a soporific drug is injected into your brain, by your brain, into your body, well, to make you reason, sleepy. Is it? And it's to <laughs> stop... It's historically when we were cave people to stop you be, like being so full of testosterone that you needed to do some violence. So there's reasons for Is this that stuff. Right? And to make women have more than one baby, we flooded with hormones, chemical hormones that make you forget how horrible it was eating the baby out. Why didn't um, the human body just evolve in such a way that made uh, having a baby easier? Yeah, do you know it what I mean? It seems less complicated exactly. to me. Well, I'm, slightly I'm slightly wondering about this. I'm still on the sex bit. Yeah. What, what, so it makes people forget. What, yeah, I mean, that's a sleep. side note, really. Goes yeah. to sleep. There's a reason why men, oh. but women don't, yeah. but men feel sleepy after an orgasm is because you get a massive rush of a. I can't remember what the name of the hormone or the chemical is. Right. But why is that even. And why does that stop violence? Because you'd otherwise be so full of adrenaline and testosterone uh, that you might be feeling violent. And it's oh, a time wow. where obviously it's right. best if you leave whoever you're with. Right. Gosh. Intact. And how do you explain the the um, the thing where you're thinking? How long's an appropriate time to leave it before I check Twitter? <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult um, to judge. I, mean, I find it's maybe very hard. maybe um, the nap well, is there for the if buffer. If there's any consolation, I feel it's like all right, of the right, genders right, do yeah. get that. I, yeah, I, think I, I feel like the I feel like the, the ice the ice the ice is thinning out on this bit of the of the conversational yeah. rink. So, so my, I think. Point, my point was my point was um, that, that I, I think, think that... Je Jeff Jeff yeah you've fallen through the ice Jeff come back we're gonna have to haul him out of the ice it's you who brought us back on I... this topic Jeff well I know on. but I've then you'd like you know it's like the ice was really thin there Jeff anyway I feel, sorry I feel like I've um, brought the level right down on your nerdy no, it's podcast Jeff. It's, so it's all Jeff what fun. I thought was until we can have untraumatic births which I agree would be a huge thing but then I'm not advocating that because I think there's a huge lobby um, who have a very valid voice of um, people who think you should have very natural labours, whatever, that's mm. a theory. So whatever, I didn't want to get into that. Instead, what I think we could do is find a way to manufacture whatever that incredible eternal sunshine of the spotless womb, <laughs> memory erasing, but very naturally and over time yeah. thing is and use it and make it into a serum that we can guzzle every time we've had a different type of trauma. Well, that's good. So, like, if there's been an election result you don't like? Exactly. Have the serum, 
look, look, look. Oh, surprise, surprise, within a handy five years, you do feel prepared to run again. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's right. Yeah. That's good. So like, I could just forget all about the bacon sandwich, <laughs> the, two, the two kitchens, the headstone, yeah, stone, yeah. the yeah. defeat, the exit pole. I mean, yeah. sorry, should I keep going on? No. Uh, that's quite good, actually. Yeah, I think, because, because and also evolutionarily, we're designed to remember bad things more clearly to protect us from them happening in the future. But it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because you You'd have thought, well, somebody might tell me about those things, mm. but you're saying that a bit like the childbirth thing. Somebody can tell you, well, childbirth is really was really oh, you horrible. Don't listen when you're pregnant, but 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 I mean, you don't think three years afterwards when you're not pregnant. Oh yes, it was horrible. You've just forgotten. Is that right? I mean, there's a I, I I even wrote it down fact by fact, a list of events, and I'll read that now and go, nah, wasn't that bad? Why have I written we nearly died? <laughs> so something about we did. So you know, about and now I'm like, I, I could go again. It is a magical thing, isn't it? it well, really presumably is. human, well, humanity would have not uh, survived if yeah. if people had remembered. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, no, I'm not doing that again. Yeah. That's a brilliant, that's or everyone that's would have had, I suppose it's the one child policy you'd have ended up with. We'd have ended mm. up like China. Yeah. 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 <laughs> that's it's a great idea. Okay, good. That's, Can we give it to Donald Trump, do you think? This, 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 this uh, no, I think we, we, we should all take uh, it. We, we should all need take it. it. Right, that should okay. be the only one that does The antidote to Donald Trump, yeah. right, okay. Uh, that's great. Jess, what else do you have? Um, so I, I, I have a... Th- a friend at university who had a theory, and I would love to test it, but half. He thought that none of our leaders should be people who want to be leaders. Mm. Because fundamentally, if you want to be a leader, then there's some element of that. Jeremy not... Corbyn is like that. Right, really? Well, he didn't want to be leader. No. I mean, in other words, he never ran thinking he was going to be leader. So of that's a quite a good. That's quite. quite he was just there to sort of lend a left wing voice to. Yeah, that. he yeah. was sort of doing it to put yeah, in a good to show. show. A whole spectrum. You know, of, maybe he would come third and sort yeah. of do, you know do a good score and all yeah. that. Anyway, yeah. so sort of carry on. So my friend's theory was we shouldn't have um, anyone that wants to be you know the leader shouldn't be. Uh, allowed, we should pluck our leaders from the electoral roll. But like I think, a lottery, kind of think that would be um, an interesting way to do it. Maybe half, because I think sometimes the motivation to lead is required once you realise how difficult it is once you're doing it. So there have to be some people that are there because they want to be there. <laughs> so you're not saying <laughs> anybody think... who's ever wanted to be a leader is in some way very deeply psychologically flawed. No, not, no, not on this. Not, podcast. You are. I'm not saying that. <laughs> but you're no. saying you don't want the power crazed, hungry maniacs, basically, and that yeah. is the problem. Problem. And it could it be levelled out by plucking people and kind of having them do it like a type of... Um, jury service? Yeah, like a type of your jury service. Do six months or a year or how, whatever you could to be effective and really get to grips with it and pick them from like um, artists or homeless people or refugees and people that would never think. I mean, there is a thing called deliberative democracy, which takes people and like discusses a certain issue with them, a random selection of 100 people. Yeah. And citizens' juries, I think they're called, and, uh, you know, ask them about specific issues. I mean, right. it is... You're, you're. I think you're on. I think it's really yeah. fertile I think there's, territory. I think there's a. I just think there's an idea. I don't know where would ever be brave enough to try. It might have to be the start of a new tiny nation somewhere. Yeah, yeah. Something. But I think there is also a really interesting thing which Jeff and I have discussed before about how do you avoid as a leader? How, how do you have the right combination of authority, but also don't become totally unempathetic yeah. and lose touch? And I think that is a really interesting mm-hmm. sort of dilemma. Because I think the problem is you've got power, you've got lots of people around you who sort of saying how good you are, it never happened to me. But, you know, uh, and then mm-hmm. and then you sort of end up, you know, uh, people, so many people are sort of blowing smoke up your what's it, that yeah. you kind of end up, you know, believing the hype. And to some extent, you sort of have to, I think, in most careers, if you want to be an ambitious, I want to be an ambitious, I am an ambitious woman. <laughs> I want to be one. I am. But you kind of also, I really value humility. Yeah. So it's the same thing of drawing that line. And I wonder if, if, we've, if you're talking about how to make up a whole government, that it might be a way of helping that by mixing up. But presumably without sounding too politically correct and sound, I mean, it's much more likely to happen to men than women, isn't it? I mean, men are much, much more likely to be dicks. I think there's the potential for that, but then... Yeah, I mean, maybe the dick quota have, of men. Maybe, I'm not just making have, a sort of anatomical yeah. point here. Uh, is much higher, don't you think? Yeah, I do. Because like the the, <laughs> the culture you've well, grown women, up in has given you permission to be a dick more. Yeah, and yeah, also and women tend will. to be. I was just reading this review of Harriet Harman's book, and it was quite poignant actually because it said that 
when she got sacked as the Social Security Secretary after 1997, she, and I never knew this, even though I know her well, mm. she never wanted to run a government department again because she'd sort of found that experience and the sort of people saying, you know, that, that she hadn't done it well and all that so sort of difficult and humiliating. Yeah. And I think women are much more likely to feel it was me than men are yeah, who are likely right. to feel it was somebody else. But that will change over time if feminism does its work and we bring our... And we have a world where women are as confident and as yeah. unflappable. And we bring that down in men and it up in women. Yeah. But it's also that line, isn't it? That spectrum. Sorry to go on about this. But it's like humility on one end. Mm. And there can be, maybe there can be too much of that. Yeah. Um, and sort of exactly. David Cameron on the other. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, sort of. Entitlement. Mm, entitlement, arrogance. Mm. Uh, let's call a fucking referendum, yeah. you know, without knowing <laughs> quite what I'm doing, and then bugger off to my shed. You know what I mean? Uh, and and it sort of mm-hmm. wears that, you know, line really. Yeah. yeah. Somebody su- was suggesting we should get him on the podcast. I'm not sure. Not after that. <laughs> That's gonna help, David. If you're listening, do come on. <laughs> um, Jess, did you have a final thing? I mean, it's a silly one. Oh, go on. Um, I think if everybody just took. Uh, one minute out of their day to watch a baby dance. I don't know if you've seen a baby dance. They all have their own special moves and it's the most instinctive, beautiful, bonkers thing. Some of them just shuffle one foot. And some of them it's a whole body snaking thing. Me dancing is quite funny too, actually. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Either Almost a baby as as or Ed. Even, what do you, are you a dancer, Jess? No, I'm not. I've become extremely self-conscious about my own dancing. Um, you are I've, embarrassing dad dancing. Yeah, now. I've been sober for a long time, and so that doesn't help. But um, <laughs> my, It was only when I met my wife that she made it very clear to me what a bad dancer I am, uh, to the extent that I don't, I don't think I'll ever dance again. I'm I know, so, I think that's so sad. I think that's now. sad, though, actually. Yeah, yeah, well, you know, you you all know the woman. She's uh, she's slowly ebbing away at what little confidence I have. <laughs> so, yeah, but, but there is an unbridled joy at watching a baby dance. Yeah. Well, it's like that. Remember that viral video from which was 2017, which was that man doing that interview and his <gasps> children barged into Amazing. the room. Oh, yeah. yeah. Best and moment that, of 2017. And actually yeah. that baby then coming in, the set that, you know, was the, the toddler comes yeah. in and then yeah. the baby comes in as well, I think. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe I can learn to dance like no one's watching. Yeah, or just like a baby. Yeah, I just, I just watch videos of babies dancing instead. Yeah. Or me, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> Are we going to have a Christmas disco, you and I? <laughs> <laughs> just the two of you. <laughs> Christmas karaoke, I think we said we might do. Uh, you, you've yet to commit to any of my karaoke invitations. Oh, no, I know. I think it's, <laughs> do I you think... karaoke, Jess? No. No, okay. I've karaoke once. Um I was forced into it by my mum. It's a family thing in America. Uh, Jess, can people see you any time? I know you were in Motherland recently, weren't you? The, yeah, that, I think that the last episode of that's just been on. I think it will be all be on iPlayer for a bit. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm Johnny Three Scenes. I'm only in episode five, <laughs> oh, but, but I'm very scene, proud of it. Scene stealer. I mean, it's very. I mean, it's a great episode. <laughs> no, it's called Motherland, and that's on iPlayer at the moment. That's brilliant. And you'll be gigging really about. It. I'm gigging to... about. I'm doing a tour in the new year of my show called The Silence of the Nans. Oh, my, um, can you just do the quick... The, the, it's such. A, Jess tells this story in her show. It's the most incredible story. And I don't want to give too much... Building it up. People should come and see it. But can you just give us the, the quick sell of what, what the show is? I try to avoid it in case people don't then want to come. But basically, I tried doing comedy on a cruise and 4,000 octogenarians for three nights and three days openly wanted me dead. I got death threats. And there you go. It was me and my baby. Who stuck on a ship? Who wouldn't want to go and see that? You got death threats. Yeah. From octogenarians. Yeah. Yeah. How extraordinary. But no, I mean, no more. You... There's a reason there's a whole show in it. It was the longest three nights and days of mine and my baby's life. <laughs> it's an astonishing story. You've got to go and see Jess tell this story. It's it's really quite something. Thanks. Lovely to have you. Oh, it's brilliant. Been You're so a, much you are fun. brilliant. Thank you. Thank you so much. Reasons to be cheerful, a podcast about ideas with Ed Miliband and Jeff Lloyd. Thanks again to Jess. You must go and see her live. It's an extraordinary story. And do you want to thank your former employee? Thanks to Torstykins uh, for doing <laughs> such a great um, uh, job. Torstykins, did you ever call him Matey Popeye or is that just for me? Uh, possibly. I think Matey Popeye's... I did check with Justine. By the way, I checked with Justine about the whole business at the... Um, uh, spe- you know the space, uh, the the sort of oh the science sp- museum. science museum, mm. and and she said I don't I, she did not remember it. I, I, I'm reinforced in my view. I don't want to reopen it, having sort of you know moved on. But I mean, 
just for those who heard last week's episode, I was rude to a lady about flying on the sort of some kind of aeroplane thing at the Science Museum with my kids after the 2015 general election. I said it was fake news. Anyway, I asked Justine genuinely. She said, I don't ever remember apologising, going up to apologise It's probably you. such a common occurrence for her, having to mop up well, the you mess it, that you leave behind well, you, you hurting just people's a, feelings. You think that, it's just a common thing? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Well, she, and she is also responsible for Matey Pop Pie. Oh, so that's, yep. that's one of hers? Yep. Definitely, she gets copyright. Okay. Copyright Justine Thornton. Thanks to Emma Corsham for producing and editing our podcast with research and backup from Alex Weissbryce and Lindsay Todd. Gail Lofthouse is our announcer. James Deacon made our eye dance. Ed Seed wrote the music. And Emily Power did such a wonderful job with our artwork. Um, oh, did we thank Heather as well? Did we, do, do we just do Tusty? We, just do, did, uh, we, we should thank Heather. I thought she was really clear she she, you know she runs this center for equitable growth i think she was sort of there at the beginning it's now 30 employees she was telling us it's obviously doing really good work so and i thought she was really clear and 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 persuasive so between now and next week's uh, episode we have you know all our christmas preparations to do and then we are giving you a christmas day treat a a milliverse jeffocracy christmas yeah Do, do you want to tell people any more than that a tease a christmas special We're doing a Christmas special, which is going to be playing class struggle, gathered round with party hats and Christmas crackers and mulled lemonade. And we're going to be playing class struggle with the amazing, brilliant Bridget Christie and the founder of the Milliverse Twitter account, Joel Corner. And we're really looking forward to it, aren't we? That's how we want to spend Christmas. It's very exciting. So uh, that's going to be it's the my next... first Christmas with you, Jeff. Let's hope that next Christmas I won't be singing Last Christmas I Gave You My Heart and the very oh. next day you gave it to Bridget Christie. Exactly. <laughs> yes. It has a certain ring to it, doesn't it? He's been Ted Miliband. He's been Sir Jeffrey Lloyd. And these have been... Reasons to be Cheerful. <laughs>